My name is Paul Gregor and I am professor of the Old Testament and uh, Biblical Archaeology at the Theological Seminary uh, at Andrews University. Uh, today I'm going to speak a little bit about Trinity uh, and its concepts as the Book of Daniel portrays. So in uh, this lecture I'm going to cover a few topics. Um, uh, first we have to talk about background a little bit uh, to touch who Daniel was, uh, where he came from, um, how he was educated, where he ended up in his uh, later days. We'll talk about the usage of God in the book of Daniel, how uh, Daniel himself uh, presents God with different names, different concepts. And last, we're going to talk about presence of Trinity in the book of Daniel and see if there is any evidence to show that Daniel uh, is aware of Trinity there at all. So, starting from the beginning, we'll talk about backgrounds first. Uh, we have to talk about um, a time when uh, Daniel was born. It was a great time in Jerusalem and Judah. Uh, he was born maybe just a few years before a great reform of Josiah, who was a great king in uh, Jerusalem and Judah at that particular time. And as he ordered, the temple is repaired and restored. Uh, they found the book, uh, and then this book initiated great reform started at 621 BC. Daniel was born maybe a couple of years earlier, maybe one year earlier, maybe three years earlier. We have no evidence to show or to prove anywhere from the book of Daniel itself or any other piece of literature uh, exact time when he was born. Uh, reform was great. It was a good time to be in Jerusalem, a good time to, to be spiritually involved in anything that was happening in temple, around the temple, Josiah tried uh, really hard to bring people back to God as his predecessors were trying to pull people away from God. So he is trying hard and it was a good time for those people who believed in God and were sincere. Uh, Josiah uh, died tragically uh, about 12 years after this reform started. So at that particular time uh, everything ended. So we may say that about 14 years of his life Daniel spent in this great mode of spiritual greatness, reform, and, uh, and appreciation for the Word of God and uh, concept of God uh, itself as it is. Uh, in those few uh, years, early years of Daniel's life, it seems that uh, his parents almost uh, maybe sensed that they have only a few years for Daniel to spend, to invest, to teach him, to educate him, to bring him to a level where he is going to be aware, uh, able to uh, stand on with himself, by himself, uh, resisting temptations of any kind, which proved a little bit later in the book of Daniel to be very crucial. So uh, he was well prepared for the time or the years which came later when he was taken to exile in 605 BC. At that particular time, he may have been 17, 18 years old, but not, not much more because uh, Babylonians were interested only in very young people uh, which they brought, who they brought with them to Babylon for education. It was not easy time for Daniel. His life, peaceful life in Jerusalem, uh, he had plans like everybody else were uh, interrupted and he was taken uh, to exile to Babylon in 605 BC. Upon his arrival, as we read in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, he was set for re-education. Uh, he was not brought to Babylon to become a slave. He was brought there to be educated. Uh, what was the purpose of this education? It is not clear in the book of Daniel, but probably Babylonians were thinking about educating people of that ethnic group and then sending them later back to Jerusalem and Judah and uh, into the service of the great king of Babylon, but we don't know for sure. As he came to Babylon, uh, he was introduced to a, a group of people who were responsible for his education and well-being. So of course that this education brought a new concepts that he never knew before in his life. Uh, probably in his, in his home in Jerusalem, he was brought up uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense of respecting God, trusting God, believing God, but he didn't know much really about other nations, gods, 
uh, how they believed in all these uh, multiple layers of deities uh, in these kind of societies. Um, we don't know what else Daniel did know or did not know, but the point is that in Babylon he was introduced to different uh, kind of education that he was not exposed before. And in this uh, education, certainly, he had to be aware of uh, what Babylonians uh, more or less believed, what happened uh, to them, uh, who is in control of everything, uh, about names of gods, and of course Marduk is the one that comes up right away as, as a god creator. Uh, he was maybe introduced to uh, some other nation gods, like uh, Akkadian gods, maybe Sumerian gods. All this literature is found in and around the Babylon, uh, indicating that people who lived in Babylon, they were aware of all these uh, multi-layer uh, dietal society that was uh, present and real in their lives. So we assume that uh, he knew that it, it, it originally there were two gods in Babylon, one husband and one wife. This is how everything started. Not one god, but two gods, who were god, gods of, or, or parents to all other gods who came a little bit later. Now, uh, when uh, you go to Akkadian story of creation, everything else, that has this epic, you will find that they have three gods in the beginning. You go to Eridogenesis, which is Sumerian account of creation, you have four gods in the beginning. So these nations did not uh, have a unique approach uh, who pre-existed creation or who pre-existed any other uh, gods or, 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 or deities that came a little bit later into literature and society of the particular ethnic group. Uh, they were different. And of course, the Daniel was exposed to this kind of education and that knowledge that uh, uh, other nations, especially Babylon, uh, differ in their approach and believe how everything started, who was in the beginning, as he knew uh, from the scripture uh, that he cherished very uh, dearly from his youth in his faith and faithfulness toward God. Uh, Daniel is carefully crafting as he writes his book down, and God is working through Daniel because as, as, as God is, is revealing his history, through uh, that statue uh, in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, and then some other uh, visions that Daniel did have, God is creating a platform for uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, to understand who Daniel was, who his God was, and how uh, he can also come into the same realm of understanding as Daniel does. Uh, God is willing to uh, 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 present the future or some events of the future based on understanding of Nebuchadnezzar. We have a typical example in chapter 2, verse 45, where this great statue is presented before Nebuchadnezzar. He sees statue, different colors, different metals. Uh, later he understood, understood that this is... Um, uh, a future of the kingdoms who, which will come after him and uh, at the end of everything, at the feet, we have a stone being taken out of the mountain and sent to smash the statue and destroy the statue altogether. Now this imagery, stone coming from the mountain, is very familiar to Nebuchadnezzar because in his understanding, gods live in mountains. They dwell in mountains. So Nebuchadnezzar had to know in his understanding, on his level, that stone came from God and became a big mound upon which God of heaven creates a new kingdom, everlasting kingdom, kingdom for all his people. This is as far as God is willing to go and Daniel also willing to go to implement the knowledge that he has received in Babylon to make King Nebuchadnezzar understand what is happening and who is in charge. He never adapted anything else, as we read in the book of Daniel, uh, in respect to multiple 
uh, gods. Okay? We don't see any evidence that he's talking about two gods. He's talking about uh, multiple layers of gods. He speaks about heavenly beings in some chapters. They talk to each other. Uh, we see Gabriel coming to uh, aid to Daniel in chapter 9 and 10, where he is in, in, in distress and in trouble, uh, trying to find answers. We see angels and heavenly beings talking to each other in chapter 8. But these heavenly beings do not, do not represent in any way a gods or different layer of gods. Daniel is very careful how he addresses God at some points and how he addresses other beings which are involved in this particular time. So there is a great spectrum of usage of God. Daniel is really uh, uh, letting his uh, knowledge of God, a character of God, who God is, how he reveals himself to human beings by giving him different names. And the same is being done also by Nebuchadnezzar himself. He, in chapter 4, especially speaks about God of heaven. Uh, in chapter 2, he speaks about Daniel's God. In chapter 3, he speaks about God of those three young people who were thrown into the furnace and survived all this uh, experience. King Nebuchadnezzar and his officials, and, his, and, uh, and later Belshazzar, and uh, the queen of Babylon, they, they have a unique approach and understanding who God of Daniel is. So they are not confused that uh, all these events, interpretations, Everything that God is presenting himself is a result of uh, uh, Babylonian pantheon. They are very careful that they understand that this is God of Daniel. This is God who is in charge of everything. He is creator. He is king of kings and so on. So uh, God is presented in different ways. In the book of Daniel, I'm going to list just a few. Of course, uh, the most common one is just God. God. Then we have a God of heaven. We have great God, God of gods, living God, most high God. Then we have Lord, Lord of kings, Lord of heaven, king of heaven, and ancient of days. All these um, titles or names are being attached to God in the book of Daniel. Now when he speaks about uh, uh, or, or use these concepts, we don't know uh, whether he's thinking about one part of Trinity or he's addressing God as universal term, referring to one God, referring to a deity that exists, who is creator, who is in charge, who is there uh, only, not only to, to oversee a globe or a whole earth, but is interested in, uh, in uh, personal life and affairs of human beings, such as Daniel, his three friends, Belshazzar, okay, and even Nebuchadnezzar. He is presented in such a way that we don't know if he's, is, is the text speaking about uh, uh, God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. We don't have evidence in the book of Daniel to show through these titles uh, that he is talking about uh, one a component of Trinity, except here, the last one, Ancient of Days. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about this, this concept, Ancient of Days, as we go through, but uh, first talking about generality of the God's, uh, usage of God's name, or his names, or titles, is given in a wide spectrum uh, through this book, and Daniel is very explicit, and he is very broad, using all these uh, concepts. Now, coming to... Um, uh, uh, terms which are uh, closely uh, related maybe to a title which uh, will be attached to uh, Son of God or as we know later Jesus Christ. We have uh, one indication in chapter 3 verse 25 when uh, we uh, see Son of God in the flames of furnace and this is, this is a reference given by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he saw the fourth person in the furnace, they threw three of them in there. He knows it should be three or none, consumed by fire, 
but now he sees four and they are freely walking to the furnace. They are not bound, they are all free, they walk and they talk. And it is interesting that he, as a hidden king, recognized the fourth person as the son of God. Now, what prompted Nebuchadnezzar to indicate this fourth person as the son of God, we don't know in the text. The text doesn't explicitly explain how he recognized, on, in what, on what basis he recognized this fourth person, son of God, but he gives him a, a, a name and he says, well, there's a fourth person, we threw three of them in there, there's the fourth one, and the fourth one looked to me as the son of God. So this phrase is present in chapter 3. Then in chapter 7, when we have a, a Daniel in vision about all these beasts, a lion, a leopard, a bear, a leopard, we have then the fourth beast which, without recognition, we have little horn going out there, and then there is a judgment at the end, and we see ancient of days being mentioned there, and then uh, there is someone coming to ancient of days, and he is given a title, son of man, in chapter 7, verse 13. Now he comes on the clouds, and he comes before the ancient of days. So evidently, in this special location, we have God, Father, and Son being together. Now, the text is not saying or explaining uh, anything about nature or function. It just indicates there is ancient of days, there is judgment, ancient of days, and there is a, a, a son of man coming uh, before uh, ancient of days in clouds. We'll address this a little bit later. Then we have Prince of the Hosts, chapter 8, verse 11, which may refer to Jesus Christ. We have Prince of Princes, certainly it refers to Christ in 8, 8, to 8, 25. Then we have Anointed One in chapter 9. Mashiach, Anointed One, who is going to be cut in the middle of the week and, and, uh, and uh, destroyed. This is also evidently uh, referring to Jesus Christ. Then Michael in chapter 10 and chapter 12 is more certainly referring to to Jesus Christ, and of course, men in linen in chapter 12 uh, also represent Jesus Christ as it is. Now, we are not going to address all these uh, titles now because of shortage of time, but I am extracting four of them to discuss in more details in respect to the book of Daniel. And of course, uh, first one is Son of God, uh, second one term is Son of Man, uh, fourth, third one is Anointed One, and Michael is number four. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about these concepts as we see them in chapter 3, 7, 9, 10, and 12 as uh, seem that they represent uh, Jesus Christ or Son of God. First, Son of God. It is used only once. This term, uh, Bar Elahin, as it is represented in chapter 2, chapter 3 actually, which is Aramaic, uh, um, Elohim is equivalent of Hebrew Elohim, uh, Bar is uh, equivalent of Hebrew Ben, a simple uh, Son of God is uh, there in chapter 3, uh, verse 25. Uh, when we go to Septuagint uh, translation of this text, uh, the term is Huio Teo, uh, which is also used in Matthew 26, 63, when Jesus is asking his disciple, who people think I am. And then Peter comes up and said, you are the son of God. The same term is used there for Jesus Christ, that he is who you tell in Matthew 26, 63. And certainly we are certain there it refers to Jesus himself as Christ or Messiah. And here should be seen also to the same uh, person who is the son of God. Talking about Son of Man, it appears in Daniel 5, Daniel 8, and Daniel 7. Okay? Daniel 5.21 uh, mentions the plural, sons of men. Okay? So certainly it has nothing to do with uh, Daniel or uh, Jesus as, as a son of man. Uh, it refers to a group of people who uh, are not uh, connected to any, in any way to, to, to deity. Uh, refers, then we have Daniel 8, 17, 
uh, which is son of man, it refers to Daniel. Daniel was called son of man in chapter 8, 17, when he was uh, in great pain, uh, trying to understand what is going on in the vision chapter 8. Then angel came to him and he uh, calls him the son of man. And then Daniel 7, 20, 7, 13, which is really where we uh, have connection with Jesus Christ, because Bar uh, Enash is used there, which is uh, equal to Ben Ish in Hebrew language. Uh, Septuagint translates this term Bar Enash as Huios Anthropo, meaning simply son of man. It has to refer to higher being. When you look at the context of 7.13, it has to refer to higher being. It is, it is son of man who is coming before uh, ancient of days. All right? It is not uh, ordinary human being like Daniel or anybody else. It has to be some higher being. He comes before ancient of days. And same imagery is used again for Jesus in Luke 21, 27, when he was also called son of man, coming on the clouds. Daniel 7, son of man, appears on the clouds. In Luke 21, son of man, who now we know is Jesus, also appears on the clouds. So we, we have a very firm picture here, which is closely related uh, one to another in the book of Daniel and Luke. And elsewhere in the book of uh, Gospels, we find a very frequent title for Jesus to be son of man. Now we come to the title anointed one and uh, most important term here, which uh, is used in Hebrew language very frequently and very often is, is Mashiach. Uh, Mashiach in, in English is Messiah. Uh, this, is, this is what we have uh, here uh, in connection and relationship and uh, bound with the name of Jesus Christ. However, Mashiach is used in different contexts. It does not always refer to God. Okay? It does not always go to Son of God or Son of Man. Mashiach may be referring to different things, like temple and objects might be anointed one. Mashiach simply means anointed one. Okay? A priest might be anointed one. A king might be anointed one. Uh, objects might be anointed in the temple services and tabernacle. Even Persian King Cyrus is called at one point in Isaiah 45, 1 as anointed one or Mashiach. He was Mashiach. God anointed him for purpose uh, that he had in mind for this great king. But only here in Daniel 5, 9, 25 and 9, 26, it refers to Jesus Christ. Because this is the uh, explanation or reflection what is going to happen in the last week of the life of Jesus Christ. And the prophecy said that he is going to be cut off in the middle of the week, anointed one shall be uh, uh, murdered or severely uh, punished uh, unfairly uh, by, by some people. So reference in Daniel 9.25 is unmistakably uh, forwarded toward Jesus Christ as we see, as we know it. Coming to um, Michael. Michael is used only three times in Daniel, which is chapter 10, uh, verse 13 and 21, and then chapter 12, verse 1. Michael. Who was Michael? Uh, chapter 10 uh, begins with a new vision where uh, Daniel is uh, looking uh, to overall history of human race all the way from the time of, uh, of, uh, of Babylonians all the way to the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ, okay? So uh, there was a struggle in chapter 10 because uh, Daniel was asking for help. He is praying and he had to fast for 20 days plus before answer comes to him, all right? He has to fast and pray for a long time. And then an uh, angel come to him and say, I, I wanted to come, but King of Persia stopped me. I couldn't go here because he was there. Obviously, King of Persia is understood to be Satan himself. He was preventing answer to Daniel coming from God. And then he, angel said, I was fighting with King of Persia for 20 days. I couldn't prevail. 
So Michael had to come. So obviously Michael is someone who is stronger than Gabriel because Michael was able to prevail and push away uh, King of Persia and so the message can be delivered to Daniel. So uh, obviously that Michael uh, may not uh, be just ordinary uh, heavenly being or, uh, or angel. It has to be somebody who is uh, equal to God himself. Uh, he is presented as chief of prince, uh, Michael himself, and uh, obviously he is more powerful than Gabriel as we see in the story of Daniel as the uh, book of Daniel portrays um, Michael. So Michael here is understood by most scholar, scholars, uh, Adventist or non Adventist who are conservative and evangelical, that it uh, represents Jesus Christ uh, as, as God himself. Now, uh, looking at the, at the <clears throat> third component of the Trinity, which is the uh, Spirit of God, or Holy Spirit, as we know it uh, in better terms, uh, we do have a presence of this concept in the book of Daniel as well. Spirit of God, or Holy Spirit, is also there. It is used four times in the book of Daniel. And it was used in a speech by individuals who are not Jews. Daniel is not using the Spirit of God in his speeches or his deliveries. He records what other people have said and used this particular term, Spirit of God. Four times used by non-Jews. It was used twice by King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. And it was used also by Queen of Babylon, uh, we don't know who the queen was, but we suspect it was, it was the queen mother who was mother of uh, reigning King Belshazzar at the time of Babylon. In chapter 5, verse 11, when this um, great uh, hand appeared on the wall and the writing appeared on the wall, no wise man could explain what the meaning of the writing was. So the queen comes into the a uh, great hall, and she says, well, don't need to worry. There is a man called Daniel in whom there is Spirit of God. Okay? When Daniel comes to the great hall, then in verse 14, Belshazzar says, are you Daniel who have Spirit of God, who possess a Spirit of God? And of course, Nebuchadnezzar earlier in chapter 4, in respect to his dreams, one about tree, which represented him who was cut down. Uh, Daniel came, explained to him the meaning of the dream. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar also speaks about Daniel in who there is the Spirit of God. Now, the term Spirit of God in Aramaic language is Ruach Elohim. Ruach is the same uh, word meaning spirit uh, as in the uh, Hebrew language, but Elohim here is equivalent of Elohim. The same term, Ruach Elohim, was used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where we have creation of the world, of everything. Uh, in the verse number 2, there is explanation uh, about the state of the earth, and there was water, and then there was a spirit of God, Ruach Elohim, hovering above the waters, above the planet. So uh, the same concept, the same wording is referring here also in the book of Daniel as uh, uh, Daniel have uh, Spirit of God in himself. So here we also have this component of, spirit, uh, of Trinity, uh, Spirit of God present in the book of Daniel. As we summarize, it is obvious that Trinity is visibly present in the book of Daniel. Uh, book of Daniel may be one book in the Old Testament which has clear indication about all three components of the Trinity present there. Uh, some books more or less do touch upon these concepts, but here in the book of Daniel, which is, by the way, the most studied, bo studied book among Adventists um, because of its uh, uh, content, and here we have uh, all three components of the Trinity present and mentioned. First of all, God, Ancient of Days, is there. And then anointed one, Michael or Messiah 
or Son of Man, Son of God comes before him on the clouds. We have them both together. And then, of course, Holy Spirit or Spirit of God also is present, as we have seen in chapter 4 and 5 uh, in uh, reference to Daniel, who was a man in who uh, Spirit of God was present in his day. W what, what is important in the of Trinity for us to understand today is that there is a God creator. He is one who creates everything, who creates us. Uh, after the fall of human race into sin, God uh, came back after man. He searched for human beings. And he set up a plan for them and for him to redeem them, to bring them back. Jesus, as Son of God, he came. He did not become Son of God after his ascension. He was there all the time. He was equal part to Godhead. He was there at creation time. He was there in the Garden of Eden. He volunteered to take this part upon himself to die on a cross so he can save human beings. And when he saved them, he said, I have to go back to my Father and I will send Holy Spirit back to you. So he will be your comforter and he will teach you what to do, what to say, and where to go. This is what is important today for us that we always have someone with us who not only did die before and left us, but he is with us through Holy Spirit helping us. And that is what the book of Daniel is revealing to us, that we have all three concepts there. Ancient of days, God, Father, we have Son of Man, or Anointed One, Messiah, Michael, and we have the Holy Spirit there as well.